Hey Cross Car fans, welcome to part two of the independent rear suspension build. Now this is a full center spool two hub build that's universal for any buggies. I designed them for my carts, my VF1 and VF2, but they are universal. This can mount to anything and I'll show you how. Uh, if you missed part one, it's where we built the center spool. Check out the link right here and then come back and watch this. So today, we're mounting Miata axles. Why Miata axles? Well, these were $130 for the pair. They have tons of plunge. Tons of plunge, which makes fabrication easy. We've got Razor 800 hubs. These are readily available. They're fairly cheap. Uh, you can get a pair of them for as low as $80. That's how much I paid for these. And these actually look like they don't need rebuilt, which is a huge bonus. Big shout out to JD's Garage. They're the ones that unlocked the Polaris Razor 800 hubs, matching with the Miata axles. A link to their channel is in the description. So definitely check those guys out. They are awesome. And finally, we have the final drive hubs. Miata bolt pattern is 4x100. That only fits car wheels. I use ATV wheels, so I'll show you how to go from 4x100 to 4x110 on the same hub so you can get inexpensive ATV wheels in a wide variety of sizes and offsets. Let's get going. All right, so first things first, um, these are used hubs. Now, this bearing could be the right size, but this was the one prescribed by JD's Garage to press into here to use Miata axles. Again, huge shout out to those guys. So, uh, it's just safe to replace this bearing. All right, so you'll need a special tool. I just picked this up at Napa on the cheap. Um, definitely wear safety glasses. Take your time and it's not too much of a bear. Now, that bearing press we got. Uh, so, the bearing press, the first time I went to change the bearing in one of my hubs. You have the choice of buying a new hub for a hundred bucks or getting a $20 bearing or $10 bearing and replacing it. It didn't take long for me to figure out that I was going to make my money back very quickly by just buying a press. Now the secret to pressing things isn't too cosmic. You want to get something flat or something a similar shape to the bearing. Now Pressing out bearings isn't a big deal. They can separate all they want. And when you press back in, you can just use the old bearing. Sockets are kind of my go-to as far as that goes. So we'll just press this old bearing out. Boom. Look at that. Came right out. Too easy. Uh, we'll just give this a good cleaning. If it's an old one and there's some rust in there, use a little bit of sandpaper. I've had to do that. But these are actually really, really nice hubs. So this is going to be a breeze. So now once it's clean, you want to get it set up. Now you can see it's on an angle. So we'll need to get something so that it presses straight. Well, that works out perfectly. And there you have it, one perfectly pressed bearing. Now, put your clip in right away so you don't forget it. We are going to press in the hubs and you don't want to leave that piece out. And we'll just clip this right back into place. A lot of these bearings come with new clips, but since this hub was in really, really good shape, I don't feel too bad reusing it. There we go. One pressed brand new bearing. This is like a brand new hub. Locked out. All right, so now it's time for the actual hubs. These get pressed in and they have the same spline for the Miata axles. They work really, really well. Everything's tight and secure. The only problem is that these are M12 bolts and they are a 4x100 bolt pattern, which is not a common ATV wheel size. 
ATV wheels take M10 bolts, and this hub is just big enough to get these in here. So here is how to convert it from 4x100 to 4x110. All right, so now I'll take a second to show you how I went from this to this to fit my stock donor ATV wheels. First, you're gonna press out these studs. All right, so I'm gonna use the wheel to get my template. I'm just stacking this up in the middle. Now, I'm going to drill my holes on this side of the plate so I can fit this in my drill press vise. Uh, I tried it this way and it didn't work. So I'm going to mark the holes on this side so I can cut down that way. Now there is, there's enough visual reference to eyeball this. I don't usually like to eyeball things, I like to measure everything, but there's so many visual cues. You can see the gap from the existing holes, and I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the gap from the outer ring. And you can take your time and you can center this perfectly. I'm just going to look at this for a long time, a very, very long time. There we go. That looks pretty perfect to me. I can't give you the straight down view. Maybe, maybe that. That's my view right there. So then I'll just take a marker and instead of trying to trace the outsides, I'll leave it straight up and down and make a circle. That gives you a smaller target to nail the center of it. And there we go. We have it marked. Now, I wasn't too worried about centering this exactly. There's plenty of meat between the holes to get it in there. Now, I know you're thinking it's going to blow through the other side, but we're using smaller bolts. We're going to use an M10 instead of M12. So this actually works out. It just works out. So now, I'm going to take my caliper. I'm going to run this out to 110 millimeters. Make sure it stays zeroed. And I'm going to verify that center is to center. I'm going to go across, measure it center to center to make sure it's logical. Now, I'm going to set this to 77 millimeters. I'm going to make sure these distances match. And they are all perfect. And now I'm going to take extra time and I'm going to get the punch exactly where I want it so the drilling works out great. Now, from my experience, my vise doesn't hold this completely level. It wiggles in there and I want to cut straight through so that there's no crazy angles. So I'll get one lined up, tighten it down, and I will get 16th inch washers. What those do, at least on my application, is it holds this plate completely level. So when I'm drilling through, it's staying flat. All right, this is drilled out at 3 eighths of an inch. All I did was measure the knurls on the stud and go a 30 second smaller, something like that, just so that they would press in. So now all we gotta do is press these in. All right, so this is the moment that you will be extremely happy or fighting mad. I am extremely happy. Look at that, that's perfect. And that's how it's done. This Alternately, you could get hub adapters, um, but this makes your buggy wider, um, which if you're looking for wide, not such a bad thing. It adds extra weight, and these studs usually poke out if you get a one inch spacer like this one. 
And these bolts, it's hard to go from M12 to M10. It's highly specialized. And these suckers are expensive. Uh, just for an example, this is a 4x100 to 4x156 one inch thickness. That's how you do that. I prefer this. So then it's just a matter of pressing your hub into your newly set up bearing. Now, this bearing is going to try to split on you when you press it. So support the inner race of that bearing when you press the hub on. Boom, there you go. Super nice. After that, we got to deal with the Miata axle. Uh, it has an anti-lock brake gear sensor on it. That's what this is. It needs cut off. Now, once it's cut off, you've got the perfect setup. Look at how nice that is. Absolutely stellar. All right, now we're going to do a mock-up assembly. Um, I say mock-up because there is going to be a final assembly once you get your A-arms or trailing arms done. That's when you will lock tight everything and make sure everything's great. So we pop the end loose just a little bit, just enough to get the bolts in. And tighten that back up. Then the Miata grease cap spacer. And then you guessed it, the Miata axle. And then, just put it on the hub. And that is one complete side. Yep. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, it's the same for the other side, whichever plate you want to use. I just have the 420 chain because it's about the same size as my rotor so it sits nice and level all right so here it is bolt together that's also a bonus of using miata axles is that the axles bolt on everything's self-contained oh it's so nice if you if you guys are longtime fans you know what i used to work with with the polaris rear ends now these heim joints and bungs are for the chain tensioning it's that tilt now you just get a piece of prescribed bar. You measure up your distance. Now you can run these aft or forward uh, to get your chain tension. So on my Predator engines, I just run the sprocket side. I don't run the brake side. So I just use one of these. Uh, on my big 1200 cc, it's got two of them. So everything's really, really solid back here. Let's get some measurements. All right, measurements. Now this is just static, static plunge. I'll call that 55 and a half hub face to hub face. Full plunge out is 57, and full plunge in is 54 and a half. So what I'm talking about, these things have a ton of plunge, making it easy to make a solid rear end. Now wheel offset is going to play a big role in the overall width of your cart. So obviously it's got about a 56 inch track width. If you put a 10 inch wide wheel on there, you are going to add five inches to each side, making it a 65 inch track width. There's plenty of rims that are made that are plus nine, minus one. So they're, they're offset to the center. With these, you're gonna need 12 inch wheels to do that. Um, I run 10 inch wheels, but the offset is enough to keep it off the hub. Um, if you come in or get a super wide wheel, you're gonna need a 12 inch. Also, if your track width is too wide, and I kind of recommend doing this anyway, is I run my axles at an angle. This reduces plunge. Plunge is how much the axle goes in and out if you didn't get that already. So by running your axles on an angle, they're moving more on a radius than they are in and out. So if they're run at an angle, 
the plunge will be reduced. That easy. Uh, don't run too much and straight isn't really too little. So that's just my, my personal stuff that I do to make it cool. And that also narrows the track width uh, by quarter inch, half inch, something like that. All right, so let's look at some practical applications. This is my budget cart or 459cc Predator engine cart. I put independent rear suspension on it using the kit or using the plans, I should say. And this thing has been absolutely phenomenal. It doesn't strip any power from that. It's still got tons of torque. Absolutely flawless. This is also an A-arm setup. Now, the reason I like A-arms is because of all the adjustability. There's eight heim joints here, which means you can control caster, camber, toe in, toe out, and just all around help you with alignment. Now here is a good look at a trailing arm setup. Now, some say this is easier, but I found it to be pretty difficult in itself. Uh, there's still plenty of adjustment, but when you adjust that way, you're bringing your toe in. So there's no adjustment on the front, so it's kind of a one-time setup. But you can see on this one, I've got the spacer run for chain alignment. And I'm also using both the bars. Now I'm not gonna run them to one tab, I just mocked that up real quick. I'm gonna use two separate tabs so that they both run straight. I've got the axles pulled so you can see how easy it is to pull the axles out. Once you pull those four bolts, the axles just slide out of the hubs so it's easy to work on. That's a 1200 cc engine. Uh, I think it's only 150 horsepower, but that's only because it redlines at like nine. It's an older bike engine. So yeah, can't wait to run that. All right, so we are set up. This is on the ground. I've got jack stands holding uh, the wheels off the ground so we can check binding. It's only travel if it doesn't bind. So there's zero. I maxed out my jack stand. <laughs> of course it did. Still no binding. That might be it. No binding. That's that's probably it right there. That's all travel right there. And that is 15 inches of travel. Just on my setup. I didn't even set it up for this long of travel. You can see that the frame is below the tire, so I didn't even set it up for this much. That's crazy. 15 inches of travel from a 56 inch hub to hub track width. It's pretty doggone good. So that's it, that's all I got, uh, enjoy. So there's a link to the plans in the description. Plans are the easiest way to get this out to the most people and it's the cheapest way for you to get your hands on this. All readily available parts, the plans include every single nut and bolt, every single component needed to get yourself an independent rear suspension. Also in the description is a link to the Facebook group. We have a strong community going. There's so many builds going on and there's a lot of other people adding to the idea of the VF1 and VF2 carts, which are variable frames. There's a guy making a cantilever suspension. They're being set up in all different ways. There's all different engines being used. Uh, JD's Garage, they used a snowmobile engine on one of these. It rips. Leave in the comments what you'd like to put independent rear suspension on. Anything from a Yerf Dog to your own Baja creation, your Desert Runner, whatever. Now get out there and start building. That's the whole idea of this, is to make a community of awesome builds. And maybe we'll all get together one day and, and race these. I don't know. We'll see what's coming. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. See you guys on the next one.